Good morning. As we prepare to gather around the Lord's table this morning, I've got a meditation message I'd like to share with you. It's titled, A Rooster Reminder. The sound of a rooster crowing probably sent shivers down Peter's spine for the rest of his life. On that faithful night in the temple court, after his third denial, that familiar sound suddenly became terrifying. Just as predicted, Peter had denied Jesus three times, and now the rooster was blaring an alarm that signaled what Peter had done. The disciple likely carried this guilt and shame with him forever. But what if Peter chose a different response? What if instead of feeling guilt every time the rooster crowed, Peter chose to be reminded, I messed up, but I am forgiven? The message of Jesus isn't one of condemnation, but of forgiveness. Today, as we take the bread and the cup, and as we're reminded of his body on the cross and the blood poured out for us, don't wallow in guilt and remorse for our failure. Instead, let it be a time of thankfulness. We have been forgiven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning as brothers and sisters in Christ to remember the extraordinary sacrifice that you made sending Jesus your beloved son to be with us. We thank you for his legacy in words, actions, and obedience to suffering on the cross. <coughs> Father, we <coughs> ask you, come to you to ask forgiveness for any thoughts, words, or deeds that did not honor your name. We invite you to inherit our heart now as we take communion. As we share this meal, Gather us together as one family, filled with your loving, filled with your love. In your Son Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
for all these blessings that we have received during the past week and we ask you to bless all the uh, all the uh, gifts that are given to you in your name we ask all these things in Jesus name Amen Yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> My special is preaching. All right. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. All right, uh, I want to give a quick update on our uh, school supplies drive that we started last week. Uh, you guys are awesome. Um, we have raised, uh, not raised, we've collected all the markers 
that is required. So if you have some, please bring them anyways. Um, it's not going to hurt for our, our, our teachers to have extras for kids that move in. And then for those who lose them, and I've never seen markers get broken so fast in my life for those that need to be replaced. So if you've bought uh, markers or you, you, um, if you forgot them at home or whatever it is, please continue to bring those. Um, the, all of them will be going to the school, uh, but you guys stepped up in a week and filled the need. Uh, I cannot tell you how, uh, how awesome that is to see you guys uh, stepping up that way in such a short time. So thank you very much for all those who have purchased markers and brought those in. Thank you guys very much. Uh, so we're going to dive right in because we've got a lot to cover uh, this morning. I did my very best to not keep it short, but maybe concise and it didn't work. <laughs> uh, so there's a, you know, if you haven't read chapter 13 in the book of Revelation, um, th there's a lot in there. There's some pretty big things we're going to deal with this morning, so we're just going to jump uh, right in. So if you would just join me in a word of prayer as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together as a family, God, to worship you openly without any fear of uh, retribution or persecution against us. And so, God, we do pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who do face persecution. God, that you would strengthen them and embolden them to sh continue to share their faith with those around them. And God, that you surround them uh, with your loving arms as only you can and bring peace and comfort in those times uh, of great persecution and stress. And so, God, we do pray for that. God, be with us as we go through this morning. May your spirit of peace and understanding uh, flow freely. God, may every ear be made ready to hear, every mind made ready to understand, and every heart made ready to accept your message for us today. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so chapter 13 is going to be broken up into two sections. Uh, the first section that we're going to look at is verses 1 through 10. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter 13. You can follow along there. If you read your Bible on your phone, open up, swipe over. However it is you get there, make sure to follow along in Scripture. There's something about reading it as we go along that's special. And so this first section, we're going to be dealing with the first beast. If you didn't know what the title of today's message is, it's the two beasts that we're going to be introduced to here in Revelation 13. The first half, we're going to look at the first beast. Uh, and as we look at this beast, it's the beast out of the sea uh, to see what terrors lie with its emergence from the abyss, which has been kind of an ongoing theme the last couple of chapters. Now, in Christendom, right, it's a fancy word for just saying the church, Christian uh, churches, we refer to uh, God the Father. God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is what? We refer to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as what? The Trinity. Okay, well, we got a quarter of you. All right. Uh, so here in this section, in this part of the drama that is the letter of Revelation from John, uh, we're going to look at the antithesis of the Holy Trinity. Now, the antithesis is the complete opposite. If it was daytime, the antithesis would be night, hot, cold. So we're going to look at the anti-trinity here uh, this morning. Last week, we looked at the first beast in Revelation. This week, we're going to be looking at the two other beasts found in this letter. So it's kind of like we're looking at an evil trinity. And I'm going to explain that as we go along. So chapter 13 forms uh, part of the theme that John began building in chapter 12 as the persecution of God's people. Uh, in chapter 12, we saw that John was dealing with the inner dynamics of the struggles uh, between good and evil. We looked at the fact that because Satan cannot attack and defeat the church as a whole, um, he will shift his focus to the individuals that make up the church. Right? That's the inner dynamics, the struggle between good and evil. In chapter 13, we see a shift from the inner dynamics, the attack on the people, uh, to the actual earthly instruments of this assault. Uh, the two dragon energized beasts. Because if you remember from last week, we were introduced to the first beast, which was the red dragon. Uh, we can only assume uh, that the beast-related activities is the way the dragon carries out his final attempts to wage war on the seed of woman, which is God's people from Revelation chapter 12. So let's dive in with uh, 
verse 1 and chapter 13. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. So we see the beast emerging from the sea, right? This symbolizes evil because the abyss was the pits uh, of the proverbial hell for this uh, culture, the first century believers. Uh, so we're seeing that this beast is emerging from the pits of hell. Like it's just, it, it, it exudes energy. Uh, uh, evil. Like the dragon, it has seven heads and ten horns. The crowns that are on the heads represent right, political, military power and indicate that Satan is the head of the beast's empire. Uh, for the original hearers of this vision, uh, they would have immediately made a real-life connection between what John was revealing to them in the Roman Empire. So we're seeing some political influences here. We're seeing the book of Revelation dealing with politics uh, in general, as in politics is uh, the, well, it's the removal of God is what we see, not just in our time, but throughout history. So again, there's going to be connections that hopefully we're seeing with today and then, and then from then till today. Um, I'm not saying that we are in the very end times, but I am saying we are in the end times. <laughs> Right, because the ascent, since the death of Christ, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, we have been in the end times. Now, will it end tomorrow? Well, I have no idea. Will it end in 100 years? Who knows? Only God does. So we're going to do our very best to live each and every day to the best that we can. That's what we need to focus on, sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone. Look at verse 2. Uh, the beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. This was very difficult to try and understand what John was saying. Uh, it seemed like every commentary I read contradicted the others. Uh, so what I ended up doing was taking the things I learned from the breadth uh, of study, I laid them out, I really did print it out uh, several pages of just similarities and differences, and we, I took them and just kind of brought the similarities together to try and understand. Uh, the, now this combination of several beasts that John uses here is an illusion uh, to uh, something we see in Daniel chapter 7. Right? In Daniel 7, it, it refers to a series of kings, uh, but here their uh, symbolism has been changed into this hodgepodge of the anti-God world systems personified in one leader. Makes the beast a pseudo-deity by giving its power, throne, and authority. So what we're seeing is just like this, like I said, hodgepodge of all these different uh, symbols representing different cultures and societies and religions being thrown into one system. And then uh, the dragon is giving this system, this beast, his authority. Now, where does the dragon's authority end? Here. Right? Remember from last week, the dragon is who? It's Satan. His power and authority is here. It's on earth. It exists nowhere else. He has no power over God. He likes to think he's as powerful as God. He's not. He doesn't come close. He understands that he's lost the war. So he's going to try to win every little battle he can. And this is where we're going to see a lot of the real life earthly instruments being played out in this chapter. Uh, so it, 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 gets, it gets hairy. So just stick with me. Uh, the first century, the Roman emperors increasingly claimed divinity. Uh, this mention of satanic power almost parallels what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Paul says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. Uh, he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Right, so all this power and all this authority... It, it just serves the lie. It's kind of like uh, an illusion. It's a misdirection. It's look at all the power and authority I have, even though I, I really don't have that much power and authority. The only power and authority Satan has over your life is the power and authority you give him. I, I want to like, pause and let that sink in a little bit. The only authority that he has in your life is what you give him. So the beast is 
not Satan that we're looking at here. That was the dragon from last week. This beast out of the abyss is a supernaturally empowered uh, human that manifests or, or is an incarnation, right? A, a representative of uh, the devil, which we see uh, is, is the antithesis of Jesus, right? The opposite of Jesus. Everything the devil does during this uh, revelation is the opposite of what God is doing. The devil tries to bring calamity and confusion into the world while God is bringing security and clarity into the world. Look at verses thir uh, 3 and 4. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Satan often imitates God. Um, here the beast mimics the death and resurrection of Jesus with the reference to the one head having a fatal wound that had been healed completely. Right, this head... Uh, we see it leads a lot of theologians and uh, historians, historians to see a parallel between the beast uh, and the emperor Nero. Uh, tradition says that Nero was so evil that he either did not really die or would be reincarnated as another tyrant, uh, like the emperor Domitian, who follows Nero. Uh, Satan will use miracles to convince the unbelieving world to follow him. Evil desires not only political power, but religious worship. Satan wants worship because he wants to be like God. The phrase, who is like the beast, uh, has two suggested origins. The first being a parody of the title of Yahweh found in Exodus chapter 15, Psalm chapter 35, and Psalm 113. The second kind of uh, believed origin here is a parody of Yahweh found in Job 41 in reference to uh, Leviathan and Behemoth in Jewish apocalyptic literature. So again, we're seeing references back to God in, in the Old Testament and some of the evils that, that God dealt with then. Um, I talked about it a little bit in Sunday school. I want to talk about it now. If you are not spending time in the Old Testament, you need to. You need to spend time there. Anytime the New Testament, Testament references Scripture or the Bible, it's not what you hold in your hand. Well, part of it. Um, they didn't have the New Testament part, right? Because they were the New Testament part. We understand that, hopefully. Uh, if not, we, I, that's my fault. <laughs> um, we're talking about the Old Testament, God's Word. So spend time in the Old Testament. If you want to understand the New Testament better, read the Old Testament. And vice versa. If you want to understand the Old Testament better, Read the New Testament. It's one story, God's story from beginning to end. It does not contradict itself. It only explains itself. Look at verses 5 through 8. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opens its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Now, uh, so we're given four characteristics of the beast. And they're laid out for us in these verses. And it kind of goes as follows. One... The beast blasphemes God. Uh, the second part, the, be the beast has authority for a limited period of time. The third one is the beast makes war against God's people. Uh, and the fourth, the beast rules the world. Now we're told that it give, it's given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Again, where does that authority exist? Here on earth. There is no heavenly authority given to the beast. It does not uh, overpower God. It does not exist on the same plane as God. Evil is beneath him. So again, power exists here and here alone. Uh, but did you notice who was still in charge as we read through this? 
It was God. Look at verse 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those names who have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So all those who worship the beast are the ones who belong to the world, whose names have not been written in the book of life. For those who have been written, the beast has no authority over us. Again, the only authority Satan has over you in your life is the authority you give him. It's the leeway, the freedom you allow him to exist in your realm, like your sphere. Now the ones that will worship the beast are the ones that God does not hold close because their name is not written in the book of life. The ones who are in the book of life are not rescued from the hardships of the beast's terror and rule, uh, but they are free from his control because they belong to God. Look at verses 9 and 10. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Whoever has ears, let them hear. That's you. Right? If you can hear my voice, listen. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Listen, your, God's plan is God's plan. What role you play is what role you play. It will get difficult. It will get hard. You will go through great times of tribulation. If you remember from all the way back, I don't remember what chapter it was. We talked about tribulation. It's this great pressing together. It's, it's this pressure that pushes. It feels like I can't make it. I can't take it anymore. I feel like I'm just treading water. That's part of God's plan. Why? No idea. Ask him. But what I've learned in my own life is in those moments of like real pressure, I'm not talking about like things are hard. I'm talking about real pressure, life altering moments. It's in those moments in the greatest despair that I've learned and grown the most in God. For whatever reason, it re most of us require the desert seasons to hit that next step in our faith. And as part of the plan, God's going to take us through all of these things, but he's going to be with us as we go through these things. Now we're going to be entering into the second half of chapter 13, where we're going to look at the second beast or the third member of the evil trinity. Uh, this beast is later called uh, the false prophet in Revelation chapter 16. Um, as a high priest of false religion, he leads the world into worshiping the first beast and the dragon. We refer uh, to this second beast as the Antichrist. Uh, so the word Antichrist only appears in 1st and 2nd John. That's the only time we see it. Uh, John expected many uh, Antichrists to appear throughout history, all of whom uh, would deny that Jesus is both divine and human. In, in Revelation 13, the hostile, uh, the hostile spirit uh, opposed to Christ is uh, really personified by the one who serves the dragon and the beast. Now the number of this Antichrist is 666. Uh, probably stood for Nero and perhaps the Emperor Domitian. Again, Paul is using things that, that are relevant in his time. As we tell stories and we share antidotes, how do we do it? With things that make sense in our lifetime. Right? Things that all of us would understand and see. Is that the case here? We have no idea. We're not told. So again, to put a name to this individual is not appropriate, and it's irresponsible, because we don't know. We will be, like we will know one day, and it will be absolutely clear. So until that time, right, we just know it's going to happen. So, but uh, it, to get back to this uh, Nero and the emperor thing, emperor worship, uh, which proclaimed Caesar as Lord uh, was a pseudo-religion that stood in opposition to proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. So we see that they're dealing with the issues there of their time. Look at verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. The reference to the lamb in this verse is an obvious parody of Jesus. Uh, his voice and message reveal his true character. Uh, later in Revelation, the second beast is always referred to as the false prophet. 
Uh, he does not seek glory for himself, but recruits the world to worship the beast and the dragon. Right, this is another parody of the work of the Holy Spirit to Jesus. So we have this unholy trinity, Satan as the parody to God the Father, the sea beast as a parody to uh, God the Son, and the land beast or false prophet as, a, as the, you know, God the Holy Spirit. Again, it is not the trinity that we know of, but it's the antithesis, right? the exact opposite of, and we see it being used in the same way. So look at verses 12 and 13. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. So the second beast uh, had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. This is important. Uh, from this, it can be gathered that uh, he was a religious character. Right? We're going to see that this, uh, this second beast is going to be fill a more religious role. And it's going to be a religious role in support of the political role ruler, the first beast. Right? He had great authority apparently derived from Satan and the political leader, and he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, the one whose fatal wound had been healed. The false religious system, which was supported in this way, uh, imitated. Again, it imitates what we know as the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right? Satan wants to be just like God, so he's going to imitate. He's going to do the same things that, that God did, not at the level. And it's all kind of a shadow game of, of misdirection and illusion. But there is power and authority here on earth that he has. So Satan seeks to take the place of God. The first beast assumes the place of Christ, right, the king of kings. And the second beast, the false prophet, uh, is a role like the spirit who causes Christians to worship God. This uh, false prophet causes the unbelievers to worship the beast and the dragon. This is Satan's final attempt to uh, substitute a false religion for the true faith in Christ. Look at verses 14 and 15. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So in addition to causing fire to come down from heaven, the second beast set up an image for the first. Right, the image was probably set up in the first temple, temple in Jerusalem, which was taken over from the Jews. Um, according to Paul, the first beast actually sat in God's temple at times and received worship, which properly belonged to God from those who did not belong to God. Perhaps the beast's image uh, was placed in the same temple to provide an object of worship uh, when the beast himself was not there. So in place of himself, they pit an idol. And we all know from scripture, idol worship is bad news. This image is mentioned frequently in John's revelation. We're going to see it uh, obviously in this chapter. We're going to see it in 14, 15, 16, 19, and 20. It's going to be a, a significant part uh, of our journey. Now, whether this image was in the form of a world, world ruler, the first beast, or merely some object of worship is not clear, but it did seem to symbolize the power of the first beast. Now, the fact that the second beast uh, could give breath to the image of the first beast, even making it speak, uh, has created problems for uh, expositors those who uh, take scripture and dive into uh, the, the foundations of the words, the etymology, and all these other things. Uh, for the Bible does not seem to indicate that Satan has the power to give life to an inanimate object. Uh, only God is the creator. Uh, so what we're seeing here is a beast's image given an impression of breathing and speaking. 
that might be a combination of natural and supernatural powers to enable the beast um, out of the earth to accomplish his purpose. Um, however, you know, it, it was accomplished. It apparently was quite convincing uh, to people because it enticed them to worship the image. Again, when anything takes our focus away from God, it leads us to bad places. The opposite of good is evil, not somewhere in between. Uh, the command to worship the image uh, as well as the first beast uh, was enforced by death to those who refused to do so. Uh, but there was a difference between the decree to put them to death and the execution of the task. The problem was completing the task of killing all those who refused to worship the dragon and the first beast uh, because ferreting out all those who belong to God would naturally take quite a bit of time. So we're seeing this as not, not an empty threat, but one that it's a task that just can't be completed. Uh, look at verses 16 and 17. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Uh, we see here a precondition for all of commerce, right? Without this mark, you cannot buy nor sell. Life becomes very, very difficult. When life becomes very, very difficult, what do we tend to do as human beings? we find a shortcut. Well, I'm really hungry. I know this is bad, but I feel like I'm starving. So I'll give in a little bit here. I'll do more over here to offset the negative over here. So we make sacrifices like, well, this isn't that bad. So we let it slide. And when you let it slide a little bit, what happens? The next one, that next step might be, might be a little bit bigger. We condition ourselves to make excuses for not doing the right thing. And so the devil is gonna make it extremely difficult for us to survive. Because to buy or sell anything will require the mark of the beast. Uh, so, I, and I love the fact that it points out that all of humanity will either be marked, meaning that you belong to the beast, or you don't. Uh, so in those moments when you don't belong and you don't have the mark, can you imagine the pressure that you feel? Can you imagine what life would be like to be completely ostracized from community? To not belong anywhere that everybody else belongs. We will be pushed all the way to the edges of, of existence in society. Because when you're pushed all the way to the edge, again, you begin to make excuses for doing the wrong thing. Well, I can't provide for my family if I don't do this. So I gotta do this. No, you don't. Everything is part of God's plan. You either belong to him or you don't. The text does not explicitly tell us what the mark is or what it will look like, uh, but the fact that it's on the right hand or forehead suggests the branding of slaves that was commonplace. Now we do know it will either be the number or the name, but we don't know what the specific name would be. Uh, this literally means that the beast will own the individual that wears the brand. Because culturally what happened when you were in servitude or a slave to someone, they branded you, it was like our cattle, your cattle. When you brand your cattle, they belong to you. Everyone else knows that. Same thing, you would brand and you will belong to him. So this, it's, 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 a, it's a real thing and it's very scary. In both the Hebrew and Greek languages, each letter in the alphabet is a numerical value. Uh, this means that each name has a corresponding number value. Uh, there has been speculation on, on the mark or the insignia of the beast, uh, but it, it, you know, it, it could reveal several different identifications. But countless attempts have been made to interpret uh, the number 666, usually using the numerical equivalents of letters in the Hebrew, Greek, or other alphabets. Uh, as there probably have been hundreds of explanations uh, continuing down to present day, uh, it's obvious that if the number refers to an individual, it is not clear uh, to whom it refers. Again, the Bible says what the Bible says. Stop trying to add to it. 
in my opinion, just it is what it is, the best interpretation is that the number six is one less than the perfect number seven. Uh, and the threefold equivalent and repetition of the six would indicate uh, for all of their attempts at deity, this evil trinity falls short every single time. Satan and the two beasts were just creatures. They were not the creator. Right? I hope we understand that. They're just creatures. They were created. They are not the creator. Look at verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate uh, the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. Six, six. Uh, the list of arguments, and I mean arguments, concerning the meaning of the number is almost as long as the list of commentators on the book. <laughs> Uh, everybody has their own opinion, and they contradict each other, and it's just constant, and they're ever-changing, and we're always adding. We're always adding to it. It is not difficult to understand why most commentators uh, have understood John's words, let him calculate the number. It's number 666. Like, we get it. Calculate the number. Uh, to be like an invitation to the reader to play... Um, it's, it's a fancy word for uh, letters with numerical values. Um, this is a game called uh, gematria, which is just where you take the word and you give it the numerical value and all these other things, uh, and discover the identity of the beast. Uh, this is not new. It's been around since the very beginning. I read commentaries uh, from early church fathers as far back as uh, the, the 1100s, where they were trying to figure out the name just as I was reading some that were picked out a couple years ago. Uh, we're not going to know it. Um, Irenaeus, which is one of them, he's a second century Greek bishop, mentions that many of the contemporary church leaders and scholars were offering many solutions to this number mystery. Yet he cautioned against the practice and believed that the name of the Antichrist was deliberately concealed because he did not exist in John's day. The name would be secret to the time of his future appearance in the world. Irenaeus expressly refutes the attempt of many to identify the name with any of the Roman emperors. He felt that uh, this approach uh, and to John's intended meaning but warns the church against endless speculations. So what does that mean for you and I? Does that mean that we need to try to figure it out? If you want to, I can show you the numerical values for the Hebrew and the Greek uh, alphabet, and we can sit down and you can play. You want to take a guess at how many different names you can build that equals 666? Yeah, it's countless. And the more you know and learn and grow in, in your, your knowledge of the world, the longer that list gets. Again, I think it was kept secret for us, just like the, the events that will lead to the very end, because if we knew it, we would constantly be looking for it. I think when you're looking to the future, what good are you today? None. So be present today. What we do see in Revelation 13 uh, gives great insight to, into the character of the tribulation caused by the dragon and the two beasts. It will be a time of one world government and one world religion with a one world economic system. Those who resist the ruler and refuse to worship him will be subject to execution. And the martyrs may outnumber the believers who survive. It will be Satan's final and ultimate attempt to cause the world to worship him and to turn them uh, from the worship of the one true God and Jesus. This chapter also makes it clear that the post-millennial dream of a world getting better and better through Christian effort and all the good things you do, preaching the gospel at every turn and supporting, is not supported. We're told that as you go out and you preach the gospel, you share the good news of Jesus, the world has continued to get worse and worse and worse. Is that a call or an excuse for us not to go out into the world? No. It should be an encouragement to continue to do so because without the church doing that, those who aren't in the book of life is going to be a long list. So what does that mean for the churches today? 
all those who claim Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It means that things are going to become unbearable at times. This has kind of become a theme for us in the understanding of the book of Revelation, that life is going to get hard, unbearably so at times. But right, we must remain focused on the mission that Jesus gave to each and every one of us. That is to go and to spread the good news of Jesus. Right, to go and share Jesus with the world. And it's a world that is desperately seeking something to make sense of the chaos. Unfortunately, what I have seen happening with the church, and I mean big C church, global church, is that all of our squabbling over political, cultural, philosophical, and ideological social issues, no matter the nation, no matter the form of government, we fail to consider we are all under the rule and reign of the kingdom of God with Jesus as our king. We stop seeing it as one whole. We see it as individuals and we fight, we squabble over things that don't matter to the kingdom. We lose perspective. We lose the fact that it is his kingdom and we begin to see it as our kingdom. And that's a very short-minded way to see the world. Though uh, not yet fully realized in all of its expression, um, his kingdom is not only something coming. Right? The kingdom of, of God is not something that is coming. It is present. The kingdom of God is real and operating right here, right now. We see miracles happening all the time. God is moving today just as he did in the beginning and he will in the end. Life here and now goes much better when we live according to that reality. Right? When we live according to that truth and we don't get consumed with what the news says is most critical or react to these issues in the way that everybody else says we should. That doesn't mean we disengage. That does not mean we stop caring about the problems we face. It simply means we view and respond to our problems as citizens of God's kingdom, supremely loyal to Jesus alone, not to any one nation, not to anything. We belong to him and to him alone. And when we keep that focus, when we respond in that, the world around us begins to change. So in a moment, we're going to close uh, with a song of worship, and we're going to get on with the rest of our day, and I hope that you have a wonderful day, but I hope that as you go through uh, not only the rest of today, but this next week, that God reveals these challenges within uh, each one of you, the areas where we, we belong fully to the kingdom of God, and the other areas where maybe I belong to the kingdom of Mike. Maybe I'm willing to sacrifice what I know I need to do because, well, this is a lot easier. Not that you would feel bad, right? Not that we would be put down or anything like that, but so that we could begin to give those places over to God. Not for yourself, but for the, those around you. The, your spheres of influence, right? Because as you influence one for positive, maybe they influence another for positive, and so on and so forth. You have no idea what your one act of godly kindness can do to somebody. I want to encourage you just to find those places, uh, repent of it, and give it to God. It may be uncomfortable. It may even be painful. But I promise the other side of it is absolutely worth it every single time. So let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer before I start ranting on again. Dear Heavenly Father, God, uh, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for your word. Though as we read it, Sometimes we, we can't see what you're doing. God, it seems like it's chaos. It seems like it's pulling us in every direction. But God, if we enter into these times uh, through prayer, God, asking you to give us wisdom to understand, we begin to see the clarity in the chaos. Though the world will be burning around us, God, you are always there. The hope that is for all those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior is still available uh, for all those who don't. And God, that no matter how bad the world gets, your goal is always to reach those who do not know you. And God, we're lucky enough to be a part of that. So God, I pray that over this next week that you burden us so with the lost, that we cannot help but share your love, your grace, your mercy, and your truth with them in hopes, God, in the hope of planting that seed that leads to an eternal salvation. 
God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.